Aldo! Welcome back, everybody. For this video, we're going to be looking at a game that isn't technically part of the mainline series, but has the words Super and Mario in its title, which is why I covered it back in 2015, which is why I'm covering it now. This, of course, is Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island, starring everyone's favorite reptilian scapegoat from Super Mario World. After debuting in that game, Yoshi quickly became one of the most popular characters to come from the Mario universe, and that newfound fame led to him starring in a bunch of spin-off games. Shigeru Miyamoto, however, apparently wasn't really a big fan of them, so he wanted to make something that he felt was more authentic to Yoshi's character. Or at least more authentic than Mario with a bazooka. But Mario games have always faced great competition as they came closer to release, and during the time between Super Mario World and its sequel in name only, the gaming landscape changed in a pretty significant way when Sony came out with the original PlayStation, and they made sure everyone knew where they thought the industry should be going. Like a 70-year-old filmmaker complaining about superhero movies if they knew what they were talking about. And weren't such a dick about it. Sony didn't just tap into the zeitgeist with the focus on 3D, they made it the zeitgeist. So for Nintendo to make a 2D platformer with such a cartoony and, dare I say, childish visual style seemed like a big risk. Nintendo themselves felt the same way. Since Donkey Kong Country was such a big hit for them, they thought that Yoshi's Island needed a similar pre-rendered 3D look to achieve the same success. The look of the final game's opening and closing cutscenes were even left over from this stage of development. But if Super Mario World was proof of anything, it's that graphics weren't important as long as the gameplay was solid. And like that game, Yoshi's Island had a really good team behind it. And for Hisashi Nogami, current producer of both the Animal Crossing and Splatoon series, Yoshi's Island was the first project he was assigned to after joining the company. Since Yoshi's Island was also released during Nintendo of America's rebellious teen period, the marketing campaign in the US was appropriately edgy. The game was featured prominently in these Nintendo Power promotional VHS tapes, and there's something inherently funny about a game with such a cutesy aesthetic being shown in such a gritty, badass way. Do you feel like something is missing from your life? Could it be that you're not getting enough Mario in your diet? Not anymore. Thanks, 2023 Nintendo. <laughs> oh my god. I should really make a video about these someday. Even for the 90s, these tapes are some of the most over-the-top, ridiculous, and strangely intense things that this company has ever put their name on. Where else can you find hired goons threatening to break some guy's thumbs if he doesn't give them secrets about frickin' Yoshi's Island? Also, you gotta love the performances given by these Nintendo employees. Ah, my mom is gonna show embarrassing pictures of me. I'm so stressed out that I'm turning into a spastic, irate gamer! And yet, somehow, they're more convincing than some of the actual actors they get to appear in the videos. The Nintendo employees at least played the games. You think these two janitors even know what a Nintendo is? Here's the deal, Jake. Baby Mario's lost, okay? And you have to rescue him and return him to his parents in the Mushroom Kingdom. Except baby Luigi is the one you have to rescue while Mario's on Yoshi's back the whole time. Actually, you know what? I'd still rather listen to them talk about games they clearly haven't played than hear Martin Scorsese complain about movies he clearly hasn't seen. Seriously, eat shit. But despite Sony proving to be a much greater threat to Nintendo than Sega, who were kind of too busy digging their own grave to really put up much of a fight this time, Yoshi's Island was met with near-universal acclaim when it launched for the Super Nintendo in 1995, and still is to this day, with many considering it to be one of the best Mario games ever made, as well as one of the greatest platformers of all time. Rob Hamilton of Honest Gamers even called it pure gaming bliss, though it may not be perfect. Then why did you give it five stars? There were quite a few games that I've been looking forward to going back to when I started doing Super Smash 3DS Revisited, but it's mostly been for one of two reasons. Some are because I just really love playing them, and others are because I felt I didn't give them a fair shot the first time around. Yoshi's Island 
falls under the ladder. I didn't even beat the game when I first reviewed it. I think I got through World 3 and then just dropped it because I wanted to get the video out as soon as possible which I did exactly 10 days after posting my original Mario World review, even though I had a cold when recording the voiceover and ended up sounding congested throughout the video, so I think it comes off as pretty rushed in that regard. Or, more likely, I just got tired of it. I didn't grow up playing it that much, or I at least didn't have as many memories with it as I did with Super Mario World, so being unfamiliar with it and limiting my time made being patient with it much harder for me. I even touched on that a bit in the video. I said that your experiences with a game can greatly affect your opinion on it, which I still believe, but I feel like I was ignoring too many of the game's better aspects and wasn't being fair enough with it. That changes today. Except for the cold, I somehow managed to get sick again while working on this video. That's partly why it took a while to get this one done and other reasons. Now, if the Mario franchise had anything resembling a cohesive chronological timeline, Yoshi's Island would be the earliest point, since it features Mario and Luigi as infants and opens with a stork delivering them to their parents, all but confirming that humans in the Mario universe reproduce asexually, which somehow explains both so much and yet so little at the same time. But while on its journey through the popcorn-shaped clouds, the stork's attacked by a new character named Kamek, whose name nobody can ever seem to pronounce correctly. Baby Mario escapes K-Mac's clutches! The Magikoopa manages to capture Luigi, while Mario is sent plummeting toward the titular Yoshi's Island, landing on the back of a wandering Yoshi, and being totally fine, because somehow he's more durable as a baby than he will be as an adult climbing up girders and kicking turtles around. The green Yoshi brings baby Mario to his friends, and at first they're not sure exactly what to do with him, but once they figure out that Luigi's been taken, they make it their mission to rescue him, prevent Kamek and his toadies from taking Mario, and get the brothers safely to their parents. In my original video, I questioned why they didn't just have one Yoshi go and rescue Luigi by themselves and have baby Mario stay behind with the other Yoshis, or yo shies as this game calls them, so that they wouldn't have to risk losing him. Well, according to the game, the bond between Mario and Luigi informs each of them where the other one is, which I guess means they have some kind of psychic connection? So baby Mario has to be with the Yoshis and help guide them to where Luigi is. Okay, but if that's the case, then do they even need the map? Maybe they're just holding on to it to give to the stork once they find it? Honestly though, I wouldn't trust that bird with delivering my kids to me. I saw the way those Rugrats were shaking around in those bags and dangling from its beak. That does not seem safe. Actually, something that I didn't really think about until now was why exactly Kamek was after the babies in the first place. Well, at the start of the fight against Roger the Potted Ghost, yes, there's a boss in a Mario game named Roger, it's implied that Kamek was able to predict that Mario and Luigi would eventually grow to become a threat to Bowser and the Koopas, so he was trying to make sure that doesn't come to be. But how are we supposed to believe anything this guy says? Because later he tries to tell us that Sluggy, another one of the bosses, doesn't have any weak points when you can hurt him by throwing eggs at his heart. Almost like it's a point where he's weak. Then after defeating the final boss, he says, Someday, we will be back. You'll see. When he's nowhere to be found in Super Mario World, and doesn't show up in the main series again until Super Mario Galaxy. In fact, how are we even supposed to know that this is actually Kamek? It could be Weisenheimer for all we know. That's Wisenheimer! Oh, sorry. Wisenheimer. My bad. Wait, now we have two Magic Koopas with names that nobody can get right? They have to be the same character then. It's just a theory. Oh, piss off, MatPat. Wow, okay. I never realized how many details were hidden in the game's story, even if it's still just as minimal as ever. But, as you can probably tell from the gameplay, Yoshi's Island is a 2D side-scroller, like its predecessors. And even though this is more of a Yoshi game, it's still got that little bit of Mario in its genes. 
and I don't mean the kind made of denim denim denim. As such, a few 2D Mario tropes are here and accounted for, like the enemies, the coins, and the world map. Although, I like how this one exists in the game's world as the map the stork was using earlier. That's a nice detail. But while Yoshi was just an expendable power-up in the last game, now he's the star of the show and is more than capable of defending himself. Like in Super Mario World, he can use his tongue to grab enemies, hold them in his mouth, and spit them out and kill other baddies in his path. But now on top of that, he can also turn them into eggs and then throw them to grab items, break blocks, and take out other foes from far away. This game also marks the debut of Yoshi's trademark flutter jump. By jumping and holding down the button, he'll kick his legs in the air to give himself some extra height. Then when bouncing off an enemy, he can do a second flutter jump that lets him go even higher. While in the air, you can also press down on the D-pad to perform a ground pound and break open wooden crates and bash pillars down under you. Going back to my original Yoshi's Island video, it's kind of funny how much I said I liked the ground pound and thought it was the most reliable of Yoshi's abilities but then ended up not using it much again during my second playthrough. On that note, I also said in my original review that I found Yoshi to be a little too heavy, but while Mario World still handles a bit tighter and overall controls better in my opinion, now I think Yoshi's Island handles very smoothly and is super responsive. The only struggles I had to deal with involved flutter jumping, but you're fighting against gravity, so it's supposed to be trickier to pull off. But if defying the laws of physics for a brief moment means getting me up to a door, then by grab Thar's hammer, I'm going to do it. Yoshi's Island doesn't have as many stages as Super Mario World, but compared to that game, the levels here are much bigger and offer a lot more in terms of exploration and discovery. Each one has five flower tokens for you to collect, which act like the dragon coins in the last game, but are often cleverly hidden or in small and hard to reach spots that force you to get creative when grabbing them. Sometimes you'll also find these little stars that add some extra time to this countdown timer, which I'll get into in a little bit. There are also 20 red coins that can sometimes be easy to spot by the subtle red tint in their sprite work, except when they're grouped together with regular coins that also have a red tint to them. And at the end of every stage, you're given a score based on how many stars, flowers, and red coins you collected. Then if you get a perfect score on every single level in a world, you unlock an extra level and a bonus game that you can replay as many times as you want. But despite the new abilities Yoshi has at his disposal, he's still pretty vulnerable, even to spikes, which kill him instantly now. <sighs> Thank god he managed to get over that by the time he got to Super Mario World. But when he takes a hit from enemies and hazards, baby Mario gets flung off his back and floats around in a bubble. Then you have to pop him out before the countdown timer runs out, otherwise Kamek and his minions will take him away, costing you a life. You can add more time to the timer and max it out to 30 by grabbing stars like I just mentioned, or passing through checkpoint rings, which each give you 10 more seconds. However, that means having to subject your ears to the sound of Mario crying while trying to get him back, which has been the most common point of criticism given to Yoshi's Island since its release. So what? Babies cry all the time, it's what they do. Just put a tablet in front of them and walk away. Because. Sadly, that's how parenting works now. Traditional power-ups like the Super Mushroom or the Fire Flower aren't present in this game, but that doesn't mean it isn't lacking in power-ups of its own. Even Baby Mario gets one. The Superstar makes him invincible, gives him a cape, and lets him run off on his own. Not a lot of levels have it, but when you find it, nab it. Oh, oh, no, 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 not yet, not yet. We'll get to you when we get to you. Now as for Yoshi, well, Firstly, there are three types of watermelon that he can eat to use different abilities. The green one lets him spit out watermelon seeds to knock enemies back and break through dirt blocks. The red one lets him spit fire. And the blue one gives him this icy breath that lets him freeze enemies. There's even an item inventory that works like in Super Mario Bros. 3, but instead of waiting to go back to the map screen and scroll through them to pick the ones you want, you can actually use them in normal levels, like the item stock in Super Mario World. All you gotta do is pause the game, select the one you want to use, and there you go. Which, I guess makes it more like Mega Man, but anyway. You get a POW block that acts as a screen nuke, killing everything in sight. 
a magnifying glass that makes red coins easier to spot and reveals hidden wing cloud locations, point stars that add 10 or 20 seconds to the countdown timer, anytime eggs that refill your egg count to the max, and wing cloud makers that turn all enemies on screen into wing clouds. These power-ups are typically given to you from completing minigames, which you access by bringing keys to locked doors and kicking this bandit's ass at some balloon or coin-related challenges, or passing through the goal ring and having the roulette wheel land on a flower token. The minigames you get here are pretty self-explanatory. There's a roulette game, a classic slot machine, card flipping, card matching, card scratching. I got this one a lot for some reason. And no cap, I kinda dreaded the ones where you get extra lives, mainly during the second half of the game, because by then my life count was super high up in the three digit range. Like, nah, I'm good fam. I needed more lives as much as I needed more Exorcist movies. I didn't. A Yoshi's Island might look cute on the surface, but trust me, it does not mess around. This is a game that does whatever it can to keep you busy for better or worse. But even though you sometimes have to go out of your way to look for hidden secrets, it never breaks the pace of the game, which is something I personally think Donkey Kong Country 2 struggled with. Playing this game also comes with a certain degree of excitement, because you don't always know where things are going to be or what exactly might happen. For example, sometimes Yoshi can undergo various transformations by touching these morph bubbles and turning into whatever vehicle is depicted on them. So you can fly around as a helicopter, dig through terrain as an awkwardly controlling mole tank, roll along tracks as a tiny little train, drive around as a putt-putt character and extend your legs to move over enemies and hazards, and fire missiles underwater as a submarine during sections that give me some serious in-the-hunt vibes. Then there will be times where you might ride Yoshi like a sled down some snow-covered hills. You might suddenly get chased by giant chain chomps. You might find yourself riding on the back of a dog named Poochie. Aerolifts might just inexplicably vanish. You might find structures that look suspiciously like the backside of a topless woman's body. You might start tripping on all the balls. You might try turning enemies into eggs while standing on a warp pipe, but then go down it and find yourself in a bonus room that's completely empty. Enemies you encounter might accidentally kill themselves, like this Bert that jumped into a pool of lava, or this Zeus guy that threw a Hadouken in my direction, then slowly started shuffling toward me, and then <laughs> fell into a pit. A lot of enemies in this game are pretty stupid now that I think about it. One level though that I specifically took issue with in my original video was 3-6. You know, the one where you had to go above the normal entrance to get a key, then bring it to a locked door that I assume led to a bonus room or something, when it's actually your only means of getting to the goal. Man, it really took me 15 minutes to figure all this out? <laughs> God, I must have been either really impatient, really stupid, or both. Well, suffice to say, it didn't take me as long to get past this stage again. I still remember World 3 being the point where the game became too much for me to handle back in the day, but generally speaking, it didn't give me nearly as much trouble this time around. If anything, the back half of the game is where it really starts to get overwhelming. Not that much, mind you, but from World 4 up to the end, enemy placement gets kind of annoying, and levels might go on a bit longer than they should. There's even a stage called the very long cave. It's almost like the game is mocking me now. Although the deep underground maze probably took me the longest to beat, as it very much lives up to its name. You have to run back and forth a bunch of times to make different things happen in order to get to the goal. It wasn't hard to figure out at all, it was just tiring. At least I wasn't under any pressure, because unlike previous 2D Mario games, Yoshi's Island doesn't have a traditional level timer, so you don't have to worry about getting to the goal before running out of time. You can just go through the game at your own pace. My playthrough ended up being longer than all three of the sessions I recorded for the Mario World video combined, not just because of there being no time limits, but frankly, I just really enjoyed wandering around and looking for stuff. I also like how much the game allows you to interact with the environment, like manipulating enemy attack patterns to benefit your progress, holding aerolifts in your mouth to spit them out somewhere else and use them to reach higher places, throwing eggs around to break away parts of the scenery, reveal hidden passages, and 
Of course, fire them through super tight spaces to get those wing clouds. Although in hindsight, I probably could have just ground pounded on the pillars to clear a path for this platform to reach the other side and then walk across it to hit the wing cloud more easily. But that requires intelligence, which I do not have. The way Yoshi's abilities can be used to affect elements of the level design in many respects makes the platforming more engaging, if a little hectic at times. Even interacting with enemies can be fun, like spitting watermelon seeds at sluggers. I don't know what he's taking to hit that fast, but clearly it's working. Yeah man, Yoshi's Island is surprisingly pretty hardcore. But one area where I think it sort of loses a bit of its edge is the boss fights. Not because I think they're bad, they're just really easy. But since we're going to be talking about the bosses, let's start with the one that I rather infamously hated the most, Naval Piranha. Remember, when I first reviewed Yoshi's Island, I didn't know anything about this game beyond level 1. So when I got to this boss in particular, I had no clue as to how I was supposed to beat him. Which I find kind of hilarious in hindsight. What am I doing wrong? Oh, pretty much everything. Lots of people in the comments were quick to tell me this, but... Basically, I tried being direct with my attacks when all I had to do was throw eggs at the opposite wall and have them bounce off and zip under the platform to hit him. And this time I was able to figure it out when this message block earlier in the level told me to throw an egg at this arrow and get the coins that were beneath me. Once I figured that out, I just applied it to the boss fight and it was suddenly a whole lot easier for me. Who would have thought? You can also imagine how pissed I was when I found that you could throw an egg at Naval Piranha and actually kill him before the fight even takes place. I don't remember who it was, but somebody showed me that clip pretty shortly after I posted my original Yoshi's Island review. So yeah, turns out this fight wasn't really that hard and I was just being a jackass. Scratch that. I still am a jackass. Where most of the other bosses lack in challenge, they fortunately make up for it in creativity. Froggy is one of my personal favorites, just based on the scenario. You're shrunk down and eaten by him, so it's not really a fight, you're just in his stomach and have to make him spit you out by throwing eggs at what I'm guessing is his uvula. And Yoshi's horrified expression before and after the fight makes it so much better. But for a lot of people, including myself, the best boss in the game is Baby Bowser. And for me, it has just as much to do with the build-up as it does with the fight itself. The time of day changes, the first level of World 6 has bones and skulls lying around, immediately giving this area a more tense and unnerving atmosphere. And even when you get to Bowser's castle, there's a message block urging you to get the hell out of there. As if the only piece of useful information it can give you right now is leave. Now, But then you actually make it to Bowser and find that he's just an annoying little shit who doesn't know the difference between a Yoshi and a donkey. I think Yoshi's Island just confirmed that donkeys exist in the Mario universe. I tried looking it up on the Mario wiki to see if there were any examples of them actually appearing in anything Mario related, and I'm sure there has to be, but it just kept giving me results for Donkey Kong. Come on, guys. I was able to find a page with the character count of roughly three tweets about the setting of an obscure children's music album based on the original Donkey Kong arcade game, but nothing about plain ass... asses. Bowser's fight is notable for being the only boss battle in the game with more than one phase. First you ground pound the floor to have the shockwave hurt him, but during the second phase, there's a giant Bowser off in the distance that comes running toward the screen, and you have to knock him back with these giant eggs and hurt him enough times until he goes down. It's one of the game's most iconic elements for a reason, because it's so scary it makes you drop enough bricks to make a goddamn house. Also, I realized while playing the footage back that his screams are just Baby Mario's crying clips slowed down. and somehow that makes this even more terrifying. But with enough patience and egg tossing, Bowser is defeated, the stork is saved, and the twins are finally reunited after one hell of a journey. And there we have it. After eight years, I finally got around to beating this game. So overall, what's my new verdict on Super Mario World 2 Yoshi's Island? 
well, seeing as how I actually finished it this time, I can confidently say that even though it doesn't really have anything to do with Super Mario World, I think it makes for a pretty great follow-up. <laughs> Yoshi's Island is deceptively safe, but under the hood, it's an absolute beast. Though the level design can maybe get a little too busy at times, you're always encouraged to power through, and it never feels cheap. Except this part in 6-4 where I tried dropping from a higher floor by falling through a gap, but died because I went outside where the camera wanted me to be in that moment. But no matter how intimidating it might seem, pressing on rewards you with fun surprises, memorable moments, and a flood of creativity. And you know, for a game with such a simple looking aesthetic, how much it actually took for the game to pull it off technologically is pretty impressive. Yoshi's Island used an updated version of the Super FX chip that allowed the designers to draw the characters and backgrounds on paper, then scan them into computers and convert them into sprite work. So every aspect of this game has this handmade look to it that adds layers and layers of heart and soul to the experience. The FX2 chip also allowed for the game to use what Nintendo calls Morphmation, which isn't just a cute nickname for Ardman's Morph series, but also meant Yoshi's Island could do things with its sprites that few other SNES or 16-bit games could, like spin them around or make them bigger. These effects aren't just something to advertise on a box either, they really do add so much charm to a game that was already so delightful to begin with, and help make Yoshi's Island one of the most visually appealing games I've ever played, let alone games made for the Super Nintendo. And yet, somehow I didn't think too much of the soundtrack back when I first reviewed this game. Ugh, God, I should have had my music lover label revoked for even thinking that, because Yoshi's Island has a great selection of tracks. The athletic theme, the castle theme, the overworld themes, the credits theme, they're all so catchy and relaxing and moody and simply unforgettable. Every single world shares the same map music, but the farther you go, the more instruments are added, giving it a much fuller sound. I also love how the last piece of music you hear in the game is the end-level fanfare from Super Mario Bros., as Mario and Luigi are held up by their parents with a caption that reads, Heroes are born, signaling the start of many more adventures to come. Despite the praises that continue to be sung of this game, for the longest time, Yoshi's Island was never given a digital re-release outside of virtual console ports of the Game Boy Advance remake, and it remains unclear as to why that was. In recent years, however, the original game has finally been made available again through the elusive SNES Classic Edition and the Nintendo Switch Online Services SNES Game Collection. Sure, you gotta fork over more cash to play the game either way compared to the 8 bucks it cost to get the GBA version for the Wii U, but most people don't have one of those and don't care enough to buy it. Except for that one guy. What a goat. Then again, the eShop is no longer active, so you're better off either emulating it or playing it through the Switch Online Expansion Pack's GBA library, even if it's pricier than a basic Switch Online plan. It's not really worth it, though, if you ask me. The remake, not the Switch Online expansion. Although... Yoshi's Island for the Game Boy Advance is still great, but... It's exactly the same as the original, except that red coins don't have the red hue on them anymore, so it's practically impossible to point them out. It's like a reverse of the SNES game. Instead of regular coins looking too much like red coins at some times, red coins look too much like regular coins at all times. But like Nintendrew mentioned in our Remakes of Mario Games video that we did a few years ago, even if it is identical to the SNES original, the game itself is still a blast, so for the most part, I guess you can get away with playing either version. I'm not sure if Yoshi's Island affected the mainline Mario games as much as the ones that came before it did, but its legacy can still be felt across the franchise. Yoshi retained many of his new abilities in future games. The arrangement of the invincibility jingle that plays when Baby Mario grabs a superstar was also utilized in several later titles. Enemies like Daisies and Bandits appeared throughout the Paper Mario series, while Raphael the Raven returned in the first Paper Mario game. Of course, Kamek made his debut in this game, and though it took a while, he eventually became a staple Mario character and was featured in the Super Mario Bros. movie. 
Even the concept of him using his magic to power up bosses was incorporated into the new Super Mario Bros. games. And now I can't help but wonder if the latest 2D Mario game was influenced by this one in some way. Yoshi's Island also spun off into its own subseries with two sequels on the DS and 3DS, and other similar platformers like Yoshi's Story, Yoshi's Woolly World, and Yoshi's Crafted World. A Yoshi's Island-inspired stage was featured as downloadable content for the Wii U version of Sonic Lost World, even though it wasn't very good and isn't Mario-related. But the most love I think this game has gotten as of late was when it was made the basis for its own track in the Mario Kart 8 Deluxe Booster Course Pass, with its own unique sound effects and victory music. Then it was brought over to Mario Kart Tour, along with the other new Booster Course tracks, making it feel less and less special. But that's a discussion for another day. Now, Nintendo might have managed to make a successful 2D game in a time when 3D was starting to become all the rage, but they knew the writing was on the wall, so ultimately they decided to make the jump as well. And next time, we're going to see if it paid off by revisiting Super Mario 64 for the Nintendo 64. Until then, this is Mark, aka Super Smash 3DS, bidding you all a smashing farewell. But as usual before I go, I just want to give a very special thank you to my superstar supporters, Red Rack, Henry Newman, and Jake Winans. I don't really have much else to say after this, and I apologize if I still sound congested like last time, although, give me credit, I tried my best to make it less obvious than before, although you could probably still tell, but I think I did an okay job. Now, since the last time I got to talk to you guys, things have been getting a little better for me. I managed to get all my medical stuff worked out. I got a job, which is also part of the reason why this took so long. It's a pretty physically demanding job, and it's taking me some time to get used to it, but I'm sure I'll get used to it in time. I meant to get this video out at some point in October, but obviously that didn't happen. Hopefully I'll at least get it out by the middle of the month. I'm still recording the voiceover, so obviously I don't know when this video is going to come out. It's just going to come out whenever it's ready. Hopefully it won't take too long, and hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Next time I see you should be around the holidays. You can probably guess what the topic of my next video is going to be. I already have all the footage recorded. I'm really excited to get to that one as soon as possible, and I hope you guys are looking forward to that. Whenever that day comes, be good, behave, be safe, be kind to one another, and uh, yeah, I'll see you guys later. Take care.